This webcast recording is from Saturday, November 12, 2016, during Designers for Learning's Education Impact Day, a 12-hour webcast-a-thon to explore one important question, what impact will you make? During this interview, we speak with Drew Davidson, Director and Teaching Professor at Carnegie Mellon's Entertainment Technology Center. We join the conversation as Drew describes the focus and purpose of the Entertainment Technology Center. What we do at the Entertainment Technology Center, for those who might not know, is um, it's a graduate program kind of like an MBA, but we focus on the creative industries. Um, so we're curious about uh, video games, film, animation, virtual reality, uh, mobile, you name it. We kind of are mixing up all those types of entertainment technologies, but then we're also very passionate about how do you use that breadth of types of technology and media to help with education and learning or medical and health or civic engagement. And nothing wrong with just trying to make something in engaging and entertaining as well, but uh, we find it's very powerful to use it as a way to sort of support or enhance or um, at least uh, work with uh, standard teaching and standard, uh, you know, uh, communication methods. Um, and so the bulk of our curriculum really focuses around getting people from different disciplines. And when we say interdisciplinary, we really mean people from multiple disciplines. Um, so we get about 40% out of technical backgrounds, 40% out of artistic backgrounds, and then in the middle we have people from all over, whether they're creative writers or business majors or theater people or musicians or we've had biology majors even in the, in, in the past. Um, and the whole point is to put them together on teams and have them make stuff together. So our focus is sort of on collaboration skills, communication, leadership, innovation. Um, and that's why we find it really important to focus on these what we call transformational goals. Um, so our students are always making something, but we're trying to challenge them to think about how to have a positive social impact and how to, you know, go out into the world and make it a better place, ideally. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of started implicitly and it's gotten much more explicit in our curriculum. And that really came from our students' um, interest and demand for that in a way. They wanted to do work. They want to go out and make a difference with whatever um, job or career they have. Um, and so that's kind of the context within which we work uh, around the Entertainment Technology Center. So this push for social change is really a really powerful one, um, especially considering the current global, global affairs and the current global state. So, so how, how are you then approaching not only the domestic social issues that need to, um, you know, be addressed, especially by the students? Because what's interesting, I find very interesting, is that the students that we teach and now we talk to, you know, millennials, X generation, Y generation, however you want to categorize them generationally, mm -hmm. um, EDA put out a report that says they're really, they're a different breed, essentially, because the desires that they have are for, um, independence, financial independence, um, social change and advocacy in a way that um, is quite unique. So how, yeah. how are you guys helping to foster and channel those energies, those you know, generational energies that are starting to see a, a, a rapid change, especially as it relates to technology and social media? Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some ways, they live in the media much more than like I do, like the faculty do. We're very aware of it. Um, but it, you know, I remember once upon a time, <laughs> you needed a map when you traveled, you know, that kind of, <laughs> and now right, who cares? Right. Uh, you have your phone on, you have everything. So they've sort of been much more immersed throughout their lives. And so they're much more naturally literative. Or I think uh, Prinsky, Mark Prinsky likes to talk about digital natives. Um, they're definitely that. Uh, and so what we try to do, which is interesting in terms of uh, academic context, because you, you know, we're not only just talking about the current social milieu and all that, but it's been interesting having certain, and I'm sure a lot of us could, this would resonate with, is students come to school and they kind of view themselves as customers. Um, so they're paying tuition and they want to, quote unquote, get what they want because, you know, the customer is always right. And I'm a little grossly simplified, but one of the things that we're fortunate in, in a lot of ways is with uh, Randy Pasha's last lecture, he was very much about, um, and so we can refer to Randy and it gives us a little gravitas to her comments, but it really is true. It's like, I, I tend to like to tell our students, if all you want to do is go do what you want, 
don't be in school paying tuition then just go do it it'll be more efficient route towards that and, you know if you're coming to school we feel it's our obligation of it as educators to challenge you in ways with our curriculum to help you grow to help you learn to help you develop more fully and so that's going to mean you're going to do things that might feel like well if i could only just work with my friends on the project i'm interested in as opposed to we're going to put you on this project as an educational goal um and it's going to be a team that we mix to make sure it's a well-mixed team and well-balanced team. Um, we find that's very important in terms of success. And we actually have a colleague who's done some research on how we try to provide these curricular constraints that help it foster innovation and creativity. And a big part that came out of her research was the importance of diversity and inclusion in that, which I think resonates a lot right now. Um, in this day and age is so like her research showed that the more diverse teams that we have, the more innovative work they do. But a f subset of that is the more diverse teams tend to have more conflict. So they need more, um, they need more constructive constraints and like helping them have those become arguments that are constructive as opposed to fights that become destructive within their realm. And so that's where we try to really push and help them grow as professionals and grow as in their creative and innovative skills, which is sort of like a muscle that you can learn to use. Um, and ideally start applying themselves to these real, you know, world problems. You know, sometimes it's, you scale from just user interface type problems. Like do people understand how to play the game or interact with the theme ride or understand the museum installation you're trying to, to develop? Because I always joke with our students because we require play testing all the time. And they'll be like, ah, oh, nobody, we had the wrong group of kids. They just didn't get it at all. And I was like, it's not the kid's fault. <laughs> They're not to blame. Um, so you need to go back and work on, uh, you know, the user interface and seeing how the flow of the experience works. Because in the end, what we're trying to challenge our students to do is design experiences that you and I can have as, you know, players or learners or guests in different types of scenarios. And ideally transformational experiences that get us to reflect on our lives and hopefully, you know, make, you know, have an impact on our day in and day out existence. Yeah. So, I mean, that really segues nicely into my next bit here because in, in 2015, so last year you did a, a webinar for AECT and the title right. of it was creative chaos. And so, you know, you're talking about these ideas of, of kind of uh, failing, failing up, right? Or, or rather, mm -hmm. uh, failing often, failing quickly, which are, are kind of these gaming design concepts and not exclusively, obviously, gaming, but, you know, coming from the arts and in that space. And so uh, located there in, in your um, at CMU is, is Shell Games, which is kind of another... Yeah to the puzzle and I was really taken by as a games based scholar I was really taken by Shell's book The Art of uh, Game Design and so That's the very book, first yeah. yeah it is really good a game of like a that it's a lenses right it's got like 84 lenses and the very first is creating this existential experience you have to create this crazy experience so could you kind of tie in that uh, webinar that you did with the notions that you are bringing about now, especially as it relates toward social changes? Sure thing. Um, so like at a higher level, like the idea of the creative chaos was sort of built on the research I was just mentioning. Um, and that was started by a colleague at Carnegie Mellon's business school, the Tepper School for Business, and her expertise is in small group innovation. And the, like I was saying earlier, she just really, she did a four year study across like you know, we're always running semester long projects with teams to four to six and they range from working with external clients that are either for, in for profit groups or nonprofit groups to faculty research and uh, grant work to students can pitch their own ideas. Um, and they're big 36 unit classes. So students probably spend 40 to 80 hours a week in these courses and they share an office together, a large office where they all sit together. And they have all of the faculty sort of are advisors for all the projects because we bring our interdisciplinary expertise to, to offer towards everything they're working on. Um, so Dr. Weingart's research for about four years looked at over 60 projects, hundreds of students, and really helped us unpack what we were doing well with our curriculum and how we could improve um, supporting sort of like innovative work and like a, that big, big part of that, like I was mentioning, is like diverse teams are so important. So having that type of mix where you have people from different backgrounds with different skills and um, 
And, you know, we were able to unpack the demographic data of teams to show that teams that have a nice balance of women to men tend to do better work, you know, statistically. And so like, there's all kinds of research out there on diversity. And one of the things that we've been pushing even further on is just being diverse isn't enough. You need to have um, people feeling included. There's this whole part about inclusion that's, I think, even more important. So like the way we talk about it is sometimes it, it can be easy to feel this sort of temptation of like, we're trying to mix a team together and we're trying to balance all of our teams. We notice we have a team of like, oh, that's a team with all Chinese students on it. Let's swap out a Chinese student, throw an American in there. It's more diverse. Yay. Um, but we, we tend to call that, you know, plus one. So now there actually might be a little churn because, and you have to give it support because that person might feel a little bit um, on the outside. And it really resonates with me. I've had a colleague when we were talking about this research and she's out in Silicon Valley and she was the only woman and the only African American in her company. So she was like, gosh, the pressure to feel like I'm representing. And, you know, it's hard to feel like she's, fit at that company when it had a whole bunch of white guys and some Asian, you know. Right. So we were talking about that sort of importance is like, what can you do to make people feel like they're, you know, included and that's just constant attention and constant communication. So it's sort of like an ongoing process. And sometimes teams are like, we solved our communication, everything's great. And I'm like, for this week, you know, something's gonna happen as you work together. And you're like, you're gonna, you just always have to be, you know, and I tell this to students and it's, it's almost so sad. It's like, here's how low the bar is just be polite if you just be polite you know people will want to work with you it'll help build a reputation and it'll put you in good stead and in a weird way i think that's more true than ever like we're you're sort of like alluding to earlier um you know just the times we live in right now in this past election we've been talking a lot this past week at carnegie mellon because we have international students we have minority students and they're very stressed and they're very um scared and we started talking about, well, God, we're Pittsburgh. We're the home of Mr. Rogers. You know, it's like, hello, neighbor. How do you be a good neighbor? You know, how do you be civil? So we've been talking a lot about that. Like, how can we get, try to re-inject that type of discourse into the public sphere of just, uh, at the very minimum, being polite and good manners. At the very best, you know, what does it mean to be a good neighbor and be there for each other? So building on that is this idea of, like, getting into, like, the second part of your question with Shell Games. It's like, Jesse's really the one who coined the idea of transformational experiences. So Jesse Shells, our distinguished professor of practice, and he runs a studio of over 100 people. I do not know how he has, does all this. There might be two Jesses. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And he wrote, you know, wrote a great book on top of that. But he really came up with this idea of like, how do we help them think about designing these experiences that have a, a goal of having a positive social impact, whether it's educational or civic or you know, better, better health. Um, and that became a core tenet to his spinoff shell games, um, which he started, Oh my goodness gracious. I think over 12 years ago now, Ooh, it's been a long time. So shell games has been around for a while. And that's a big part of, I bet half of their work is what they would consider in this transformational space where the other half is more towards a uh, uh, straight up entertainment. And they do internal projects and client projects at shell games. Um, and so I think part of what's fun and I think helps with our students, and I think a lot of us could resonate with this, is they look to the faculty for our experience. Because in some ways, if you're a programmer, you know more about programming than I do at this day and age. I haven't taught programming since, God, Flash. It's been for so long. You know, so like I'm not, I'm not the best person to do code review. I'm, I could probably mess you up. Um, I'm, I'm happy to easily break your code for you. But like we uh -huh. are interdisciplinary mix, we do have programmers who can sit down and do code review. And we have people who do this and do, you know, do and can critique art really well. And a lot of our programmers have never been critiqued. They're used to coming out mm -hmm. of CS where like, well, my code works, I'm done. And, mm -hmm. you know, you go through play testing, like, well, your game is playable, but kids hate it. Right. You're not done. <laughs> keep going. You know, right. Right. keep designing, right. keep working. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And a big part of all of that that I think is really important for us in a way that we hope carries forward is in our first semester of school, all of our students have to take improvisational acting. Um, so mm -hmm. everybody goes wow. to improv, um, not to be funny or better actors, mm -hmm. um, but to think about how to share, sharing credit, sharing space, mm -hmm. sharing ideas. Right. Um, and it's such a great brainstorming yeah. paradigm with that classic, I mean, you hear a lot about it with SNL from the comedy side, the whole yes and thing. Mm -hmm. um, yep. 
so visceral when you're on stage trying to do a little improv together when you are not sharing ideas right. and it's not working. Mm -hmm. The scene isn't coming together and you feel it painfully. So, um, and we hope that translates to when you're on a project and you're trying to make this game or the scene and installation or this mobile app, that's more important that, than your algorithm that's so clever or your art that you hope so pretty, even though the client doesn't like it. So like, how can you as a team work together to focus on what that important thing is? And then we hope it scales to like, could that important thing have a positive impact in our world? And then how do you, how do you sort of like set aside your ego and flow into making that type of work? Amazing. So among the many scholars uh, that I'm familiar with, you, you really are working on some of the most engaging, fun, authentic, and yes, I said fun <laughs> projects, right? <laughs> I think that, that really resonate with learners and really resonate not only with learners, but people in the ways in which they make sense of their world. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I want you to talk a little bit about those projects, you know, from, from the play summit to COVG to, um, you know, the stuff that you were doing with GLS to uh, remake learning at right? all these spaces and places that you're engaged in. Um, in some capacity, whether it be an advisor or an executive board, or kind of kind of break break down a couple of those little projects that are your your gems that you um, have been involved in over the years. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with rewing learning. That's really interesting. Oh wait, no, reel it back. I love that you like you sort of, like <laughs> preface. You know, and I did say fun. Um, yeah. Fun. One of the things we talk a lot about in terms of like unpacking what it means to be fun, because sometimes I can feel so amorphous towards useless, is a big part of fun for us is like a level of engagement. Like it gets into the chick sent me highs idea of flow and that type of immersion yeah. and engagement, yeah. which we believe really leads to challenge and like having things appropriately challenged. So in an educational context, it's about scaffolding content. And, you know, in a game like content, it's about um, slowly working your way through the levels till you get to the boss fight. Um, and if it's a well-designed game or well-designed learning experience, in both cases, you develop a mastery just by engaging. Um, and so it's that type of challenge. And, I've, and I'm sure a lot of us, if we've played games, some games are radically too easy, so we get bored really quickly. Like a lot of us adults probably don't play tic-tac-toe anymore because we got it. We understand. Unless we have kids mm -hmm. and they think tic-tac-toe is awesome and they will crack that code. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a movie out there, uh, you know, and then games can be much too hard and you get too frustrated. So it's like, that's where you get into the idea of flow and appropriately challenge and scaffolding on um, those things. So we really, we really believe in like looking towards finding that sort of sweet spot that is a moving variable for a lot of people. Um, but then getting into projects, like what's been really like humbling and awesome at like with the remake learning. And for those who don't know, I think it's remakelearning.org. Um, here in Pittsburgh, yes. it, it's yes. a lot like some of the MacArthur work when they were trying to set up hives in cities um, mm -hmm. where we were trying to get together. But Pittsburgh's just wonderful. I was surprised. I moved here to Pittsburgh from Austin, Texas. Um, so I'm not native to the area, but it was such a nice size city and that it was large enough and had enough of a history that there's great cultural institutions. There's great museums. There's great um theater there's just all kinds of opportunities and there's something you know they care about sports a lot around here i don't know why no I'm joking there's something like this <laughs> <I> hear. <laughs> um right. so uh you know there's all of that here but it's a small enough city that you can kind of get your head around everything that's around and people know each other really well and they collaborate really well so remake learning was the attempt to get anybody who cared about you know the quality of life for kids for k through 12 almost like k through higher ed um who wanted to meet. So like directors of museums are showing up, um, teachers are showing up, superintendents are showing up, uh, professors from college are showing up, people from out of school uh, learning and our maker spaces are showing up. And so it was this wonderful gestalt of people getting together and it's, it's spawned for us so many amazing projects, like two that I'll mention just in passing and it's two of yeah. God dozens. But it, at one meeting, we were doing this group brainstorming exercise and Jesse shell was in the meeting too. And he had the idea that everybody voted on the most. So he'd been invited up to talk mm. about his idea. And I was sitting in the back with um, Jane Warner, who's the director of the children's museum. And we were both commiserating because we both are, I brainstorming ideas got the least votes. <laughs> 
we were sort of like joking with each other going, ah, yeah, look at us. We got the least votes, but we both <laughs> liked Jesse's idea. He was talking about what he called the dream factory. Like, could there be a Ooh. maker space that was staffed with the facilities and facilitators that kids could just walk in um, and say like, I want to make a robot. And people were like, all right, let's talk about how you do that. Um, and so that led to us uh, getting together to do what has evolved into what's called the make shop. So a maker space inside the children's museum here in Pittsburgh. Um, this was, gosh, eight years ago now. So at the time, it was fairly early. Um, early enough that it really got the attention of Make Magazine and Dale Doherty. Um, and so a lot of people. But what I was so inspired by was Jane. And like, yeah. nobody, we didn't have funding for it yet. We all just thought it was a good idea. And we decided to do a collaboration between Carnegie Mellon with us, uh, the museum, and then the University of Pittsburgh's Childhood Learning and Out School, Out of School Environments, Up Close. Kevin Crowley's group, um, the three of us. So he was willing to donate a PhD researcher to study what we were trying to do. Um, the museum carved out some space in an existing floor. They didn't have any budget, but they're like, we'll just kind of put it over here. And we donated three students for summer internships. So we started the make shop with like no funding, just like with people. And, um, and just by being able to show that kids were showing up and they were really interested and they were just blew their minds that helped us start getting funding to help grow it and then took over the museum it's become like their shining jewel for why people go um and jane's been going around like the world now talking about ways to have maker spaces and other institutions um so that was just a wonderful thing that happened here um at the same time with remake learning we also met um the superintendent of a local school district elizabeth forward school district that is the southernmost district in Allegheny County. And for those of you who don't know the Pittsburgh area really well, when you get outside of the city limits, it gets rural really quickly. And at the time we started collaborating, <laughs> yeah. right. Elizabeth Ford was probably, I think, if not the bottom, in the bottom rankings of the state in terms of school districts and their graduate, you know, their graduation rates and how their mm -hmm. students were doing. Mm -hmm. So they, the superintendent is like, we need to get creative. We need to try stuff differently um and so we we were willing to start doing projects together so we went after grants together to try to get more technology to try to train their teachers and it led to like a project where we helped them create a fab lab within the school so sort of like uh, you know it's a sort of a more modernized version of shop so we got their shop teachers on board and one shop teacher resigned because he was like this is not shop <laughs> you know he was used to chop saws and all that and this you know we're bringing in 3d printers and cnc routers and stuff like that um and so we also were really inspired by the work that we had done with the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago, doing what they called Umedia. So we helped them sort of transform their library, which is sort of making a maker space in a library system. So we did that with their school library as well. And then together we helped them get a small lab, the situated media and learning labs, kind of like connect on steroids. And the whole idea is to do embodied learning exercises. That, so like you take math class and you get into a small lab and you run around and play math games. They've been able to show that you know, <laughs> kids who do that actually retain the math knowledge better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then they kind of do group learning exercises in the small lab. And what was really inspiring about that project was a couple of things. One, just by having our graduate students show up to their school district to chat with the teachers and the students, their kids started talking about going to college. They noticed this huge uptick of interest in school. Um, and for a lot of their students, it was the first time they met somebody from another country. Um, what was really inspiring too, is a lot of their young girls were like, I want to be like her. They wanted to be like some of our female graduate students and they were like, getting really inspired. And so before you even talk about the projects and the education, just that, just by like inhabiting the same space happened to inspire students. Um, right. and then we started trying to make games and what was fascinating there was, and so on the one hand, the superintendent going, we're going to do this. On the other hand, the teachers, if you're not, if you're going to make something and the teachers don't think it's good or it's not working for them, that was that small lab's just going to gather dust. So it probably took us, and we do semester on projects, so it probably took a year in which two projects happened across that year where we worked really hard with our faculty and our graduate students to, to make the teachers feel like co-creators in this process. So that they had a voice in the design decisions and, and you know the students as well we wanted to make sure they thought what was happening but it probably took a whole year before the teachers started turning around and go wait this small app could be useful um and 
So we, we worked really, really hard and it was intentionally so to make certain that the teachers had an input into what was getting made because we wanted them to use it and have, have it have um, a good impact for them. And now like the small lab, it's signed out all the time. It's like standing room only anytime anybody wants to use it. But it took like about a year to get the teachers on board because, you know, it's like, here's more technology and like, oh, just add something else to my plate, you know? <laughs> um, so those two things just coming out of the remake learning just show like just an inkling of it. And I think what's awesome that I've seen here and gives me so much hope for us writ large is this is happening all over. Like Pittsburgh's not unique in this regard. We've seen it in Cleveland. We've seen it down in Charlotte. You know, we've seen it, you know, we've, cities are interconnecting and people are doing great stuff everywhere. And, you know, one of the great things about the internet is it's helping people connect to each other to pull all of that up. Um, so that's been awesome. And the best ideas survive, right? The best ideas thrive and survive and move on. Yeah. That's great. So uh, there's a question from Nicola uh, Pallet. I'm going to open it up a bit and before I ask you uh, the final question. But okay. um, what, what do you think is the link between learning design and game design? Um, that's kind of uh, the basic one. Designing playful learning experiences is what she has here. There's she's, no link at all. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I could not say it more eloquently than James Paul G did in his book that I still think, you know, there's a lot of books out there that kind of try to address this, but his book about what video games teach us about learning and literacy, I still think just some, did that the best. Um, it's just so well written and it just really encapsulates that. And what he gets at is in both cases, learning design and game design, a well-designed experience is just in and, in and of itself educational. So when you're mm -hmm. playing Super Mario, it teaches you how to play and you get goals and you get, you know, and then you learn your skills as you get going. And then those skills start combining together as the levels get harder and the game gets more difficult so that you have to raise your game as it were. And in the same way, really well-designed learning experiences challenge students and help them grow their knowledge and they build on that learning together. Um, and, you know, so I, at the time he was, when he was like real first for the book, I remember him really talking about. It. So if you look at school, school in and of itself is not the best design learning experience um, as a system. He's like teachers within that system have made amazing, you know, it's almost like in spite of that type of systemized learning, teachers do brilliant learning design. Um, and one of the, my favorite examples that I still think is just so evocative is the work that Katie Salen did with the quest to learn schools. Um, yeah. She started those in New York. I think there's some in Chicago now. And the whole idea was like, could they use the idea of game design as a lens for how they designed the whole learning experience through a six through 12 um, public school in New York City? Um, so everything's sort of taught with the idea of like building your skills together to, diff, you know, to pass these levels of learning that were tied into um, the scaffolded goals that they had and also the, you know, sort of common core type um, experiences. And I thought that was just really powerful and showed uh, a lot of what you could do because I know we talk a lot and I don't think there's a lot of talk about oh my god kids are so engaged like this summer Pokemon Go boom everybody's playing Pokemon Go you know so a lot of people started like you start seeing this uptick on like ed tech blogs of like so Pokemon Go is really engaging how do I use that to help teach kids something um, and what's powerful for me and for teachers so I've had talks with lots of teachers where sometimes their first reaction would be you're trying to replace me by creating a game that teaches that doesn't, so you don't need teachers anymore. And I think it's the exact opposite. Um, games are complementary, um, and they need that sort of remediation, that sort of scaffolding around them so that teachers can help guide and help surface that knowledge. Otherwise, the whole idea of transference, like if you're playing a math game, your math scores go up. But if it's something where the teacher can connect it, because like any type of learning, you're connecting to the kids and what matters to them. Um, across the board and so like teachers help make that happen and so i think it's just more important than ever in that regard yeah they feel they feel they can help fill in those those missing gaps you know assassin's exactly. creed so some of the work that i've done in assassin's creed is you know they right. take creative liberties and the the teachers can help fill the gaps of fact in history right historical fact mm -hmm. and cultural facts where there may be some creative liberties taken which are perfectly admirable in games because they help create uh, a different type of flow by the way we, we can go we can go on and on and on yeah, right. that 
let me let me ask you this final question and if hopefully we have some other people that have some more questions but i'm going to ask this one now is i'd like you to think about what inspires you um, and what has inspired you um, from your long history in this space and and doing your work and then how you're transferring that to the students and putting the students at the center um, and mentoring them so um it's kind of a two-part question but what really so inspires small. you toward making an impact, <laughs> right toward, toward making an impact right because that's the main yeah. question that we're asking what impact will you make so what kind of inspired you kind of historically and then you know how you're how you're transferring that to your students toward making the impact that you desire to make within the educational sphere okay <laughs> it's five words or less no um <laughs> piece of cake <laughs> um, thinking about like inspiring like and I don't like at, at a high level it's like good teachers um, I just remember I, I tell my my students when I was an undergrad I changed majors eight times because <laughs> I was at the University of North Carolina and I was a very good liberal arts school and I was like I seem to look for the good teachers and like those classes that really got you going and part of that was um, and UNC at the time had this great program I'm not going to get the acronym right it's, it's, it was like apples and it stood for something, some academic acronym, but it was really about social service connected to classwork. So like when you're in the, when you're taking classes that were connected to the Apples program, um, that meant you were doing social work as well in, in relation to the work you're doing in class. Um, the thing that really, so that like got me going about how do you make an impact? How do you get involved? Um, like going way back, I remember growing up, I, you know, as a white male, a very privileged life I've had. Um, but my parents were like, books are free. You can spend, you know, your, your like allowance on other stuff. We'll, we'll take you to the library. We'll buy you a book a week and stuff like that. So like they always encouraged me to read. Um, so I think that opened up worlds and what I try to do passing for like in both cases, what I think what good teachers do within the context, it's like, how do you tap into our innate curiosity? I think we're born curious. And then in some ways, the drudgery of modern life not you know beats curiosity out of us. Um, but the thing that I hope to pass on to students moving forward is like this this passion to want to make a difference, a focus that helps them sort of look for ways that they feel like that's attainable as opposed to they feel hopeless um, in some ways. Um, and this idea of like we talk about is like a liter a literacy of curiosity. Like, how do you start feeling really comfortable about things you don't know because you want to learn? Um, particularly with our current crop of students, they're predicting very long careers, like a decade or two longer than ours um, because of cost of living and their life, you know, or probably expectancy is a little longer than us. Um, so I'm imagining, like, if you looked five years ago and somebody told you that virtual reality was going to come back, I would have laughed because, like, why? But now virtual reality is hot. It's the biggest thing. But 10 years from now, it's going to be something else. 20 years from now, it's going to be something we don't even know about. And so our students are going to be challenged in just unbelievable ways about doing things, you know, having jobs that don't exist right now, doing things they haven't done before. And if they have that sort of like lifelong learning skills and a, just innate curiosity to understand and explore, like their lives are going to be full and fulfilling. And that's, that was what I hope for everyone. It's like that you have something where you feel like you're fulfilling. Um, you know, just like your needs, your passions, your, you know, and the world itself. Like, I think there's a lot of things to be said for service. Like we're talking a lot now. It's like, what can we do? Uh, Cause I believe education is the way you make a difference. Education is the way people accept, you know, more diverse perspectives, more, you know, we, you know, from certain perspectives, education liberalizes people and that's horrible. Um, but I think, for, I think it broadens our horizons and opens us up. And I, so I believe that's one of the most important things. Wow. Fantastic. There is one more question that we've got to ask you. Yeah, just uh, okay. right here. So Jared, Jared Dingwell's got a question about games. Um, so right. when, we, when we think about games, we often think of platformers like Mario or um, mobile games like Angry Birds. Um, what kinds of things have you encountered on the fringe that may or may not be traditional games, but might have the ability to build empathy or other kinds of learning in players and what strategies might you discuss with your students that doesn't involve earning points and badges um i'm thinking in my head I'm yeah thinking that question in my head <laughs> <laughs> so that's games actually like, games like journey and things like you know anyway um 
Yeah, because I think what's there are a couple routes you could go with that. Because I totally like the idea of gamification almost makes me vomit in my mouth yeah. sometimes. Um, you know, just assigning points to things and getting people to be you know chase after scores and stuff. I, I was really more inspired back in the day when we were doing U Media with Nicole Pinkard's work at her Digital Youth Network in Chicago, um, where she talked about. So it was an out of school program with inner city youth, and she had this whole sort of leveling system. And you leveled up through your skills um, so that like level twos and then she incentivized peer mentoring. So level twos, part of your job was to help level ones and level threes help level twos. And so you watched it just to encourage people to start helping each other out. And I was just inspired by that. But uh, certain types of games I think that are really interesting to think about are um, collaborative type games that you see a lot more in board games than necessarily video games. You, we're starting to see it a lot now too where there's sort of cooperative collaborative games out there um like one that comes to mind is pandemic the board game which i highly recommend it's a board game where you've played together against the board and basically an algorithm of the deck of cards um and so it gets people talking and i love it like the there's like the difficult way to play and that's where you're not allowed to talk about your cards <laughs> um so you're really trying to strategize because usually the easier ways where you talk and i prefer that um, is where we're all talking together going, well, what's our strategy on the board? And so I think that gets at some sort of like collaborative behavior, you know, like things like MMOs um, and some of the work Constance Steinkuhler did studying like World of Warcraft and how people in groups were enacting the scientific method to, to explore the affordances of the game world. Um, and um, the last thing that comes to mind are some of the unbelievably complex um, live action role playing experiences that are being designed. Um, a lot of it's coming out of Europe. Some of the, there was this crazy one with Battlestar Galactica. Um, that what so it got people together. So they're enacting improv skills where they're black boxing character stuff. They were showing up and getting into character for the weekend. So a very communal activity happened. And some people are using that type of like mixture of you know improv and performance with some rule sets that are coming out of like a game type environment to create things where you explore emotional things like yeah, a relationship. Like we had a group of students for games for change last year, try to do a game um, for the festival that was going to be an interactive performance where the audience was um, putting in questions for one character to ask the other. And the whole idea was talking about gun ownership um, and gun laws within the states and so we were trying to use that as a way to engender conversation and get people talking and feeling engaged and like they have an agency i think that's one of the most powerful things about games and this is why students and kids find them so compelling is you feel like you matter when you're playing a game your actions and your your abilities you feel like you have this agency which sometimes school makes you feel the exact opposite like you have no agency over your day and no agency over what you're doing um and, and sometimes life probably makes you feel the exact opposite um, but I think that's like developing that muscle, those sort of like programming, not programming, problem solving skills. Um, so you feel like you can tackle challenges that come your way. You can solve something. You know, you can figure it out. You know, you can ask for help too. That's another thing that's great learning to play in these collaborative games. It's like, you don't have to do it by yourself. Fantastic. Well, we want to thank you so much for taking the time and spending with us and sharing your, you know, your wisdom and your experiences. Sure thing. Um, we, we, we will need to catch up at some point because uh, I'll be seeing you in February for the Frog Cub convention. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most too. definitely. And, and you're doing some really, really neat things. So we want to appreciate yeah, you and thank you so much. And uh, make sure you, you check out his uh, Twitter feed. I've posted that. And I'm so lame um, at Twitter. I'm just saying <laughs> it's like reposting my blog post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or check out um, his work at CMU. All cool. right. Thanks a bunch. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Care. All right. Have a good one, Jason. Thank you, Drew. All right. Take care, Drew. Thanks. Bye. Bye.